last year I, I was talking about what I do here in Monterey and I said, well, you do, I, I do theory and research and all those sort of things. And the other person was an American academic and, and she asked, um, and, and who do you teach in the theory course? I said, well, I teach my students. But no, no, I mean, what do you teach? What, which theorist do you teach? Who do you teach? And I was really stuck. Actually, I don't have a great respect for many of my colleagues in this particular field. Uh, and I couldn't think of them. I thought, well, yes, yes, there's only, there's only one theorist that I actually teach as a theorist, as a set of ideas, and that's Lawrence Venuti. He said, oh, wow, I love him. And I said, well, yeah, I teach him, but, you know, with reservations, but I think it's, it, it, it's, it's, um, and it, now I'm breaking up out of that conversation. I, I, I do teach this particular man, firstly because he's American, and he's living the same reality we're experiencing while we're here in Monterey. American culture, if you like. Um, and, and secondly, because he has a very coherent set of ideas that stimulate people to think about what they're doing when they translate. Okay? And his topic is visibility. Visibility um, doesn't mean the physical act of being able to see somebody, although it could. It, it really means being publicly known. Generally, translation is one of those things that is considered invisible and good to be invisible and becomes visible when it goes wrong. I want to share with you a few experiences or a few actually press clippings of uh, translation going wrong and becoming visible. Visible here in the Spanish what? press. Forty police in Malaga interrogated for corruption. Well, there's nothing new there. Well, forty is a lot. But then two interpreters arrested. One of them accused of selling information. At last, we've got into the headlines. <laughs> Another press clipping from the same source. Three police interpreters sentenced for falsifying the nationality of immigrants. Hmm, interesting. Okay, at least we're intervening, at least we're doing something actively in this immigration problem. This I like particularly. Two sworn translators. Sworn translators mean they're really translating in court. Uh, in Spanish context. Arrested for relations with money forgery operation. At least they're getting more money. We hope they were getting more money before they got arrested. <coughs> Perhaps not real money, but you know. This one I particularly like. Trial suspended because Chinese translator does not know Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, at least we're visible, okay? <laughs> when we're incompetent. If you read down, the, the judge just suspended the trial because he had no idea what the interpreter was saying. And, and my favorite is this last one. Uh, trial suspended because the only translator of Chinese was the accused. <laughs> okay, so it's not true that the translators and interpreters here are always invisible. In Spain, at least, they tend to become highly invisible, uh, but not in the way we would really want. And the question is, really, is there a kind of visibility that is uh, on this side of public scandal or illegality? Uh, and what would it be like? And how would it relate to the kind of invisibility that many of us are trained uh, to aim for? In our classes, I don't know if you've had this experience, but, but it's sometimes said, you know, the, the translator, the translation is good when people read it and they don't know it's a translation. What does that mean? The act of translation has um, been effaced. The translator works so well that it reads like a non-translation. Invisibility. It's an ideal that is, I think, uh, taught in many translation classes. And not just in the United States or Britain. But we'll ask about that later. Now, Venuti's argument, and you've all read the text, haven't you? Some of them have, yes. It wasn't too hard. No. 
His argument is really quite uh, clear and succinct, and I hope that this summary will not offend you, although we'll go over it later. Offend you as being reductive. First argument is that the ideal among what he's terming Anglo-American translators, United States and Britain, um, the ideal is to be invisible, and he picks this up in, um, in press statements, in reviews of translators. Good translator, not there. Translated well because I didn't know it was a translation. Things like that. This means they are not publicly appreciated. That seems to make some sense. Hence, they are underpaid. Hence, their contracts are usually on the basis of work for hire. Here his point really concerns literary works where an author will get a commission a percentage of future sales, that is royalties, and a few translators, it seems, uh, are paid that way. They sell work for hire, you sell your labor by the hour, in, in this case, or by the thousands of words, or whatever. And the upshot of this is that in these cultures there are very few translations because it's not a rewarding profession, so people don't go into it, people are not aware of it, the degree, the level of translations is low, Vernuti gives the statistics, the percentage of, in, in the United States, percentage of translated books to non-translated books is 2 to 4 percent. Okay, of all the books published, if you have 100 books published, 2 to 4 percent will be translations, whereas if you go into most other cultures, the percentage is much higher. In uh, French, Spanish, 20, 25 percent, German, 35 and above. Uh, almost any other culture or uh, language of book production has a higher percentage. So this would fit in. Uh, this means that Anglo-American culture remains virtually ignorant of foreign cultures because of the low presence of foreign texts on, on their bookshelves, which is what he's looking at, bookshelves, book, book translation. And the result is that Anglo-American culture Verdicti says, it is scarcely an exaggeration to say that this culture is imperialistic abroad and xenophobic at home, said by an American academic. That sounds pretty bad. So if this chain of logic <coughs> is correct and every link is solid, causal, we could change the last one by changing the first one. If we translated differently, more visibly, we would get more money, we would be appreciated, we would get better contracts, you would then have uh, a worthwhile economic activity, you would have more, of, more translations being produced, more discussions of translations in the press, more awareness within this culture of foreign cultures, and less imperialism and less xenophobia and all things good will happen if only we can change the way you translate. Hence, the end of the book, call to action. Change the way you translate. Do not aspire to invisibility. You are simply effacing yourself and you're not doing anybody any good. Powerful, coherent argument. Have I summed it up correctly? What could be wrong with that argument? Oops, yes. Well, as you were going, you were speaking of so, so if we make them more visible and people, well, there's two things. If they're more visible, uh, you, you, you have to change the paradigm that people have of, well, I don't, I don't know, did, how do you make them visible without people thinking it's a mistake? I mean, in, in the parts of the book, uh, parts of the chapters that I read, it says that the only time anyone notices it is if there's something wrong with it. Well, how do you get them to notice it without there being something wrong with it? There's that one. And then the second one I was thinking is, is okay, so, so translation becomes more appreciated and it becomes discussed more. The only problem is when you discuss translations, at least to my mind, you have to be familiar with both languages to some degree or, or, or another. And the vast majority of people aren't in America or Britain. They're not... They don't speak more than one language. Yes, okay, so there are two good reasons or to have some doubts here. Visible to whom? 
and in what way, and is visibility necessary via, necessarily via mistakes and errors. Uh, for the first one, Venuti does give examples of what he terms, uh, going back to Schleiermacher, uh, foreignizing translation. That is, there is a way of translating a text so that the, the syntactic structures and the mode of thought of the foreign culture shines through the target language. Uh, and we all have experience of that. You, you've all picked up a text and read it and said, well, it's in English, but it's a translation. I can see the other language, the other mode of thought coming through. So I think there is that, that neutral ground for playing, not neutral, but there is an overlap ground where it's not wrong, it's not stupid, it's not, not idiotic to do some things, but you can make a, especially literary language, sound foreign in English. If you can do that, then you can create discussion of the foreign without extensive knowledge of the foreign language. Okay. Would be Venuti's argument. Okay? But, yeah, I, you can see some of the potential weaknesses here. I want to go over... Oh, hold on, I got my, fav my flavor of the week. Uh, with apologies to people who were in the course on talk on, uh, on Monday. I, I'd like to compare this with eco, eco ecology, eco translatology, eco, 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 like ecology. Depends. It depends. Okay. All right. It's the abbreviation one. It's not an abbreviation. This is Chinese translation theory to save the world. But Venuti's going to save the world. I just want to compare that set of arguments with uh, this view of translation, um, which has, uh, I've discovered, a, an international eco-translatology association. Uh, it has its second conference in Shanghai, actually this month. Um, and people are talking about it. And this is for the sake of the Chinese people who complain, oh, we never do anything Chinese. This is your big chance. No, a little cheap. Um, this is of some interest, okay? Uh, to compare with the kind of argument you just saw, all right? Um, Ecotranslatology, what does it do? All right. Uh, this is from the programmatic text of the conference. So. A translator both adapts and selects, which is good, so translators are not just visible, they're adapting and selecting, they're active, they're intervening in accordance with the specific configuration of the translational eco-environment. So this sounds pretty good. You, you will have noticed that translation theory in the West has been going from the text to context, to more to wider views of language through pragmatics, then the incorporation of sociological notions, the identity of the translator, the sorts of things we've been doing. So this is very encouraging to see that we're not just talking about the text, you know, the, the king that was dethroned, said Femer, uh, we're now talking about the entire environment, all the elements around the translator. The aim is therefore uh, to describe these translational activities, including the essence, process, criteria, principles, methods, and phenomena of translation, in terms of such ecological principles as Holism, relevance, dynamics, balance and harmony, together with ecological aesthetics. Now this is a very clever set of ideas because it draws on what are considered the fundamental principles of traditional Chinese philosophy. Harmony, balance, ecology, the system all working together. And it's the perfect product, if I were in China trying to sell something Chinese to Western intellectuals, this is what I would do. Because it's sort of going to where Western intellectuals want to go anyway, with a wider attention to context. But it's pointing out that, that in, uh, in uh, Asian philosophy, these ideas of the wider context and being in tune with the wider whole have been there for a long time long time. We have only to go back to them and rediscover them. Now, if I compare those two ideas, one is a way of studying the relation between translator and context 
in terms of harmony, dynamics, and balance, and holism. And then Venuti, or indeed most of the people in Western translation theory who've talked about translation and society, there's one alarming difference, that the Westerners, almost all of us, are into fighting, antagonism, the struggle, the opposition, the critique, the we've got the answer, you guys haven't got the answer, we're better than you, we've got the way to go forward, this is what you have to do. And I come here and all that has sort of disappeared and we can, with attention and some calm, uh, work in relation to all the elements to strike what I was seeking elsewhere as cooperation. And I'm, interest, I'm just interested to see what happens, to see the way that goes. Do we want to go with a Venuti type view of conflict and struggle, call to arms, call to actions, or this opposed view which seems to seek something quite different in an almost postmodern perspective? I'll return to that when I've considered Venuti in some detail. Venuti starts his, uh, his book with a definition of what he's going to talk about. Invisibility is the term I will use to describe the translator's situation and activity in contemporary Anglo-American culture. Now this is an interesting way to start because he's assuming that the description is valid, but there's no other term for it, so that's what you've got. How can you see something that's invisible? If it's there and it's invisible, how can he see it? And is he the only one? And if some people can see it, then it's not invisible. You have to describe somehow this position of the person who can see as opposed to the vast majority who cannot see. You have to attribute yourself with some epistemological enlightenment. Does this describe all the translators, or just the few? It seems to describe all of them. But Lawrence Venuti himself is a translator. So he's described himself as being invisible. But he's not, because his name is on the front cover of a very thick book, and several of them, of theory and of translations. And then, fair enough, if there's a thing called Anglo-American culture, does this mean that only the translators in that culture are invisible? Or does this apply to all cultures with all translators? It seems to be that this invisibility is exceptional to Anglo-American culture. And I'm going to ask you in the second part of the course, what about your cultures? Do people in your cultures uh, believe that invisibility is a desirable thing for translators? Are you trained in your culture to disappear? Certainly the Chinese interpreters, when they're telling me they're doing consec and they're not allowed to look at the audience, they've got to look as if they were not really there and the audience were not really there, certainly that would be the, uh, an extreme case of imposed invisibility. And yet, here, invisibility is considered to be something specific somehow to Anglo-American culture. And I'm interested if this invisibility concerns both production and reception. Um, that is, something is invisible because there are not many books published, I can understand that, 2 to 4 percent is pretty low. But then, what happens in the actual space of reception where somebody gets books and does something with them, or in the reception of communication, do we have any information on this, on the way people actually deal with these texts called translations?